Code said they'd base their organization on the Jesuits. The Jesuits were famous for setting up front organizations, having people fight each other while they remain unscathed at the back, out of sight. A front organization in each country was to be set up to the existing local round table group. This front organization called the Royal Institute of International Affairs. It's a front organization. Had as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged round table group. In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations. It was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with the very small American round table group. It's much bigger now, of course. The American organizers, organizers were dominated by the large number of Morgan experts, including Lamont and Beer, had gone to the Paris Peace Conference and they became close friends with a similar group of English experts which had been recruited by the Milner Group. In fact, the original plans for the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations were drawn up at Paris. The Council of the Royal Institute of International Affairs says which in Curtis's energy came to be housed in Chatham House across St. James Square from the Astors, from the Astor family, who was helping fund it too. I was soon known by the name of this headquarters, and the board of the Council on Foreign Relations have carried ever since the marks of their origin. Until 1960, the council at Chatham House was dominated by the dwindling group of Milner's associates, while the paid staff members were largely the, agent of Ly- the agents of Lionel Curtis. The round table for years until 1961 was edited from the back door of Chatham House, Browns and Ormond Yard, and its telephone came through the Chatham House switchboard. The New York branch was dominated by the associates of the Morgan Bank. Then he goes into all the different characters involved in running that system from and out of the Morgan Bank over many, many years. Names all the different big family names, which are very, very well known. The academic figures have been those linked to Morgan, such as James T. Shortwell, Seymour, Joseph P. Chamberlain, Philip Jessup, Isaiah Bowman, and more recently Philip Mosley. Grayson L. Kirk and Henry M. Winston or Riston. The Wall Street contracts with these created originally from Morgan's influence in handling large academic endowments. You see, if you want to shape the world, you must make sure that what's been taught in the universities is your version of history, and you also teach them through the humanities why you must change the future by giving a particular slant on history. Very famous for creating very strong slants on history to influence the future. It says here, closely allied with the Morgan influence were a small group of Wall Street law firms whose chief figures were Elihu Root, John W. Davis, Paul D. Cravath, Russell Leffingwell, and the Dulles brothers. The Dulles brothers were in and out of the CIA their whole lives long. I'll be back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm Alan Ward. We're cutting through the matrix, putting together some of the events that happened in the 20th century and showing you the reasons, or at least the, the big institutions behind them. This parallel government, as it's also called, I, I call it the true government because they advise everyone else as to what to do. And they're one of the premier think tanks that advise on all kinds of foreign policy, etc., and reading from Tragedy and Hope from the guy who was the historian for this particular group and got a hold of all the records and who believed in their cause too, by the way. And reading from his book, Tragedy and Hope, on page 953, he says, on this basis, which was originally financial and goes back to George Peabody, very important person again, that grew up in the 20th century, a power structure between London and New York, which penetrated deeply into university life, the press, in the practice of foreign policy. This is what they call in Britain an MI6, uh, and Margaret Thatcher used it all the time, uh, our special relationship with the United States. Our special relationship is never elaborated upon, but that's what she was talking about. In England, the centre was a round table group. In the US, it was J.P. Morgan and Company, or its local branches in Boston, Philadelphia, and Cleveland. Some rather incidental examples of the operations of this structure are very revealing just because they're incidental. For example, it's set up in Princeton, 
a reasonable copy of the Round Table Group's chief Oxford headquarters, which was All Souls College. They made a duplicate in the United States. That's where the real, the guys who are in the real big picture are allowed into All Souls College. The copy they set up in the U.S. is called the Institute for Advanced Study. If you look into the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's still there today, because it spearheads most of the social studies that are taught across the planet. Einstein stayed there until his death at that as a faculty uh, member there in 55. And you'll find too uh, that Robert Oppenheimer of the Manhattan Project also was there. Many big people were there because that really sets the tone for all the other universities. They were the ones who also came up for all the programming, the language for the computer systems we're using now. They're way ahead of everything. But they're right into social studies, what I would call social engineering. That's the real goal. Have a look into their site. It's up on the web. So that's a copy of All Souls College. This copy called the Institute for Advanced Study and best known perhaps as the refuge of Einstein, Oppenheimer, John von Neumann, and George F. Kinnan, was organized by Abraham Flexner of the Carnegie Foundation and Rockefeller's General Education Board after, he'd been, after, after he had experienced the delights of all souls while serving at Rhodes Memorial Lecturer at Oxford. The plans were largely drawn up by Tom Jones, one of the round table's most active intriguers and foundation administrators. Learn what the word intrigue means. It's very important in the way they operate the world. Yeah, I'll take them later. Yeah. The American branch of this English establishment exerted much of its influence through five American newspapers, the New York Times, New York Herald Tribune, Christian Science Monitor, Washington Post, and the lamented Boston Evening Transcript. In fact, the editor of the Christian Science Monitor was the chief American correspondent anonymously of the Round Table Journal and Lord Lothian, the original editor of the Round Table and later Secretary of the Rhodes Trust an ambassador to Washington was a frequent writer in the Monitor it may be mentioned that the existence of this Wall Street Anglo-American axis is quite obvious once it is pointed out it is reflected in the fact that such Wall Street luminaries such as John W. Davis Lewis Douglas, John Whitney and Douglas Dillon were appointed to be American ambassadors in London and then goes on to talk about the different countries and how they set it up for different blocks, including the Far East, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada as well. And how they basically run the country, the countries ever since. So the financing came from the same international banking groups for, for Canada, Australia, Canada. And it says in England, Chatham House was financed for both networks by the contributions of Sir Abe Bailey, the Astor family and additional funds largely acquired by the persuasive powers of Linus Lionel Curtis. The financial difficulties of the IPR, the Institute for Pacific Relations, that's what they called the Australian branch at one point. It was a front group, as they say, a dummy group for the Royal Institute of International Affairs. It says in the British Dominions in the Depression of 2935 resulted in a very revealing effort to save money when the local Institute of International Affairs absorbed the local Pacific Council both of which were, in a way, expensive and needless, needless fronts for their local roundtable groups. The chief aims of this elaborate, semi-secret organization were largely commendable. Now, remember, Quigley was all for the, this whole movement, to coordinate the international activities and outlooks of all the English-speaking world into one, which would largely, if it is true, be that of the London group, to work to maintain the peace, and their own version of peace. Remember, they started wars. Uh, like the Boer War, to help backward colonial and underdeveloped areas to advance towards stable stability, law and order, and prosperity along lines somewhat similar to those taught at Oxford at the University of London, especially the School of Econo Economics. And everyone who studied the London School of Economics gets an idea of the re revolutionary aspects that comes out of it, and the schools of African and Oriental Studies. These organizations and their financial backers were, were in no sense reactionary or fascistic persons as communist propaganda would like to depict them. Quite the contrary, they were, they were gracious. This is Quigley's view of it because he belongs to that type of elite himself. 
They were gracious and cultured gentlemen of somewhat limited social experience.